Okay, I hope you can hear me. All right, let me get the better. This is a before and after kind of thing here. Okay, before. Does that work? Okay. Whoa. Okay. Welcome to another gathering for John Towler, Abyss Cause to Abyss, Sinking into God with John Towler. Tonight, our theme will be the ascension of Christ and being raised above through the ascension of Christ. So we're going to look at four sermons or so from John Towler, pages 293 to 313 uh, uh, in the, vo the Elliot volume of uh, Towler's sermons. Just so you can see where we're at. You know, in choosing what sermons to look at, I had to make some decisions. Um, and so April 17th tonight, the Ascension of Christ, he does have four or so, four or five sermons on the resurrection we could have looked at as well. But you can look at them on your own uh, time. Um, so this week we'll look at the Ascension. And then next month, May 15th, as we get close to Pentecost, it'll be preparing for the Holy Spirit and a daily Pentecost, as John Toller describes it, which can happen in our souls. Um, and so, you know, as we're in this Easter season, um, some of the resurrection themes and ascension themes are very much related and intertwined, the two mysteries, resurrection and ascension. Um, and so, yeah, it's it, it fits with the season we're in. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me just make sure we're all set here and I'll start with prayer. Okay, so we'll uh, turn first to our Blessed Mother, asking for her prayers for us. We might welcome uh, the risen Christ into our lives more and more, live more his life than our own. So we pray, remember, O oh, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, our mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. Lord, help us to seek things that are above, where the Lord Jesus is seated at your right hand, Father. Help us to remember heaven to remember our origin and our home in you and continue to fill us uh, with your life as we keep our eyes fixed on things above that we might let your light shine into our world today. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy Father, St. Dominic, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Catherine of Siena, pray for us. St. Augustine, pray for us. Uh, St. Vincent Fair, pray for us. John Toller, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know, if we had to capture John Toller's kind of main idea with the ascension and what we read in our sermons today, 
we had to capture it at the scripture passage. We probably couldn't do better than Colossians chapter 3. The first four verses. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your hearts on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ our life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Okay. So it's worth noting that it's not just John Tyler, but the inspired word of God itself beckons us, encourages us, admonishes us uh, to set our hearts on things above, not on earthly things. For we died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. And the idea is that the more we set our hearts on things above, the more we receive God's life the more that we receive God's light, the more we see things in light of eternity, the more we see things in light of God, the more we see things as God sees them. Um, and so to set our hearts on things above helps us to see things aright, to see things in truth, right? Often we're so caught up in our day-to-day -day activities, so caught up in our pursuits that we forget eternity, we forget God. We forget our heavenly homeland, right? And our heavenly homeland is eternal, uh, much longer than this, this passing life. So it is a very helpful spiritual practice to set our hearts on things above. And just practically, you know, it is hard to think about God throughout the day. Just practically, it, it is hard to cast ourselves on the Lord and receive the fullness of life from him. And so practically speaking, this really helps to set our hearts on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God, right? If our life is now in Christ hidden in God, uh, to receive that light into our souls to the full, we want to keep our hearts fixed there. We want to keep looking there. We don't want to get, we don't want to let the world the noise of the world drown it out, our life in God. And so Tyler uh, is very strong and adamant uh, about letting our hearts follow Christ into heaven. John Tyler, he's very much following St. Augustine here. I think also for the liturgy, liturgy of the Hours for the Feast of the Ascension, we get our second reading for the Office of Readings from St. Augustine. And the idea is you are where your heart is and the body goes where the head has gone. Christ, our head has ascended into heaven and the body, his mystical body, the church is with them. Our hearts follow Jesus up to heaven. He's our beloved and our hearts uh, stay with him. So we live in heaven as much as we live on earth. Maybe in some ways, even we live in heaven more than we live on earth because that's where our hearts are on eternal things, focus on eternal things with our beloved, the Lord Jesus, hidden, seated at the right hand of the Father, our life hidden with Christ in God. Philippians 3 you know, has that beautiful line, our citizenship is in heaven. So to have that conviction that that is our true homeland, Hebrews 11 gives a strong account of that as well. Right, All these heroes of faith, they labored for things they did not receive in this life, Abraham uh, and the others, because they labored looking for a city uh, who has foundations laid by God. They, they were waiting, looking for a heavenly homeland, Hebrews 11 tells us, and that helped them to, to be the fathers of faith. It helped them to live out a radical faith. Right? And John Toller explicitly says, that if we're not living this way with our hearts and eyes fixed on heavenly things, fixed on eternity, we're going to live simply a natural life. We're not going to live a supernatural life as radically as we could. We're going to just pursue natural ends. Okay, try to live a happy life, be nice to people, um, 
you know, those are all great things. Um, but no, we're, we're made for something greater, not simply natural happiness or natural ends. We're made to share in the life of God. We have a supernatural destiny. And we're not going to live that out to the full in a radical way unless our hearts are fixed on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. You know, think of St. Paul too in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if for this life only we hoped in Christ, we are the most pitiable of all people. Right. If if it turns out that Christ hasn't risen from the dead, and that we don't, uh, heaven's not awaiting us an eternal share in his his victory and life with God. Um, if our Christian life just ends here on earth, like we're the most pitiable of all people, uh, because the implication is that we've like sacrificed <laughs> a lot. Um, with respect to kind of natural ends or just an earthly life, right? Where we're not living a comfortable earthly existence. We're stretching out for more. And so if that more in the end, like doesn't exist, like we're the most pitiable of all people, we should have just eaten, drinking and been merry. <laughs> um, if this, if earth is all that there is. Uh, but no, in fact, earth is not all there is. Uh, there's heaven. And we want to, fix our eyes we want to have our lives oriented there into eternity and letting our hearts follow christ where he is now seated at the right hand of the father uh, helps us to live this out so john Paul really pushes this and and that's why because it is it is a great help right in faith like the fathers of faith in hebrews 11 we go out beyond natural bounds and natural happiness to live in the land of promise, looking forward to the, the heavenly city as strangers and exiles on earth. Um, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if all this isn't true, well, then we're the most pitiable of all people. Uh, Romans 4, 17, 17 through 21, hoping against hope, Abraham put his faith in God uh, when it seemed like everything was set against him. Uh, and that's pure faith. Um, here we have no lasting city, Hebrews 13, 14. Hebrews 10, 37, the coming one will come soon. John 16, 16 through 19, a little while, you'll see me no longer, then a little while, you will see me. So just, just some scriptures that are very much the basis of what John Powler, the attitude we see in John Powler, and very much come together. And so, to yeah, to live that out strongly until yeah learn learn from john power in this way okay so you know he reads you know saint augustine would have been well read people would have read saint augustine a lot in the middle ages so john power is very much schooled in saint augustine so he's building on saint augustine's theme here okay without further ado we'll just dive into the first sermon we looked at for tonight oh by the way uh, at the end of my presentation part, uh, we'll open it up to questions or, or comments. And so just as we're going, if you want to type in comments or questions, uh, then at the end, um, we'll take a look at those. Okay. Um, so the first sermon uh, for the Feast of the Ascension is page 293. And the verse he's looking at is it shows up in Mark. Uh, 16, 14, and Jesus rebukes the disciples for their unbelief. And John Pollard notes that Jesus continues to rebuke us for our unbelief, right? So this is right, um, you know, before Christ ascends into heaven and he rebukes them for their unbelief. He rebukes us for our hardness of heart. You know, I've thought before, just pondering that passage this Easter, we can kind of see every time we come into the Lord Jesus, this Eucharistic presence, uh, that just his Eucharistic presence rebukes our unbelief, rebukes our hardness of heart. Just coming into the presence of the Lord, our faith grows, and he drives out our unbelief. He softens our heart. 
He overcomes our hardness of heart, right? Abiding with the Lord and Eucharistic adoration, reading his word, uh, rebukes unbelief. It brings our unbelief uh, to naught, to nothing. And so, yeah, the Lord Jesus does continue this work of rebuking our unbelief. And it's good, right, to have that rebuked. Be gone, unbelief, right? In the name of Jesus, he drives it out. We want to be people full of belief, right? To see God and to see all things in light of him. To see things as God sees them through the light of faith. Everything else is falsehood. So, John Tyler, he kind of lumps together hardness of heart and unbelief that Jesus comes to rebuke. And he notes that, you know, sometimes in life, he, you know, he really highlights religious consecrated persons. Um, but, you know, this can apply to, to other people as well. Um, he notes that sometimes, right, we can simply fall into just external observance. And, you know, this is this is a theme in John Toller, kind of that interior renewal. You know, it's often a theme of like reformers throughout the ages. We've been, you know, going through these practices, but, you know, whatever, where's the interiority of it? Is your interiority pure before God? Are you seeking, you know, God, God alone? Are your intentions pure? You know, that's this has been happening, right, from Old Testament times. Think of Jeremiah 7, you know, no longer say, oh, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, uh, because the Lord has shut out your prayers, right? Because your heart's not uh, in tune with him and his ways. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to fall into the mistake of saying, okay, external observance, we don't need it. Uh, habitual practices are bad or something. No, uh, but we do want to make sure there's, yeah, the interior heartbeat of love that's kind of enlivening thing. And we all just need to be kind of reminded of that time and time again. We want to, we need to be awakened out of our slumber. Think of Revelation chapter two, the first word to the churches um, involves, you know, um, come back to your first love. Where is the love you had at first? Um, and, you know, it's worth appreciating that this call to our first love doesn't mean like our love's going to be exactly like when we first began in the spiritual life, the early days of fervor, you know, love does mature. And so it's not like to, it's going to be exactly uh, the way in our first days, but you know, our first love, the Lord himself, putting him front and center, having him enliven our hearts and be our motivation for all we do. Approaching him with uh, expectant faith and prayer, uh, still like, eager for what he has for us, still eager and full of hope about the depths of our relationship with him, what he can bring about in our lives, what our intimacy with him can be like, you know, return to that, seeking that. And then, right, then our external observances, you know, come alive. Uh, then they're, they're all uh, enlivened with the spirit of, of seeking the Lord and intimacy with him. I've said it before, you know, John Tyler, it, it is more like the fine tuning knob that he's turning. And so, you know, don't read this as like the coarse tuning knob, uh, like he's saying, get rid of external observances or whatever. No, I mean, he sees that the point of those and the benefit and how helpful they are, right? We're beings in time. Our life unfolds over time. And so our life commitments unfold according to like a schedule or regularity. Um, and so, yeah, our prayer schedules, or part and parcel of our gift of self to God as beings in time spread out over time, not just one like act of fervor and giving oneself over to the Lord, but yes, that act of fervor and giving oneself over to the Lord. And that plays out over time through our daily commitments and our schedules. So John Tyler, right? He is, he is about, you know, the fine tuning. Yes. The external observances and then animated with, attentiveness to love you know he says like even singing the psalms this is a little maybe jab against uh monks perhaps um you know oh singing and chanting you know okay chant all day the psalms okay well you know even songbirds can sing all day you know god doesn't just want songbirds he wants your heart he wants your heart and you know it can be chanting the psalms that helps you to give god your heart 
keep your heart focused on him. But, you know, that's the the bottom line. That's the focus of everything. And so John Tyler wants to kind of keep that before us. He wants to keep that before us. Okay. And so he says um, that we can be kind of going through the motion, so to speak, and I have lost that interior search for the living water. So I'll just pull up the slide here. And he's going to use the image from Jeremiah chapter two. The Lord complained. It's interesting, you know, Tyler doesn't quote this, but Jeremiah, I think verse three or chapter two, verse three, but early on, um, there is the bridal imagery. And the Lord says that you have forsaken the love of your, your youth. And so he's calling Israel back to that in the early part of Jeremiah chapter two. And then Jeremiah uh, 2, 13, um, you get the classic uh, correction from the Lord. Or just, um, My people have committed two, two sins, two errors. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have built their own cisterns, cisterns that hold no water. And so Tyler says that, you know, sometimes just an external observance, we can lose the, the living water. We can lose that search for the fountain of living water, the Lord himself, through our chanting of the Psalms, through our praying, our vocal prayer, through our praying the rosary. And we, we he wants to call us back to that, make sure that's alive, um, and to return to the love we had at the beginning. Okay, so here are um, Tyler's words on this. Oh, okay. Well, oh, that's okay. Um, so Jesus rebukes, continues to rebuke us for unbelief. And uh, Tyler notes, our lack of faith clearly appears if anything suits us better than God. Or if we cannot truly say, thou art my God, and nothing is well with me except in thee. These men have, in fact, fallen off from a real and living faith. Um, and this is true of them, though they may have the name of being spiritual men and have been under God's influence, even supernaturally sleeping or waking and have been admonished by him in their inmost heart. It's an awful thing that when our Lord has abraded them for hardness of heart and has called out unto them, they do not relish divine things. They have no taste for their prayers and spiritual practices, whereas other things give them great pleasure. Their hearts are soft to many things, but are stony enough to God. Of such as these, if God will save them, the Lord spoke by his prophet. And I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. And let us ask what makes these men's hearts hard. Why are they so dry and cold about all good works or only do them by a sort of of outward observance. It is because their heart cherishes something that is not God and continues in that state in spite of our Lord's admonition. And then he says, you know, as the Lord says in Jeremiah 2, and then you have forsaken me, the fount of living water, and built your own cistern, cisterns that hold no water. He goes on to say they do external works, but have forsaken kind of the interiority of it, the fount of living water not at all penetrate into the inner meaning from which all from which alone all good must spring forth they never turn to the interior life for that they have not they have no thirst for that they have no thirst right so you know this first line is helpful here our lack of faith clearly appears if anything suits us better than god right or if we don't find in god our highest good Right? How is, how is that a lack of faith? Well, because right, clearly God is the source of every good thing. She, you know, he truly towers uh, about above everything in the created order. We don't see it clearly because we live by faith, right? But anything that's true, anything that's good, anything that's beautiful in the world is but just a, a, a glimmer, a pale reflection of the Lord God himself, who is, you know, the absolute good, absolute beauty, absolute truth. And so if something is suiting us better than God, suiting us more than God, we don't really see God as he truly is. 
we're not seeing him uh, clearly with the eyes of faith. Um, so yeah, if we, so faith really opens us to God as he is. And so, yeah, he's cherished above all things. And then too, and then another thing he points out of this lack of faith, unbelief and hardness of heart. Well, it's because we're not turned to interior, to interior things. We don't savor interior things, right? So practically, what can we do about that? Well, you know, let's say you pray the liturgy of the hours and let's say, you know, you pray it in private. Um, well, you might kind of slow down and savor the sacred texts. You know, the introduction to the liturgy of the hours, it notes that you can kind of, you can do the liturgy of the hours in like a Lexio Divino, Lexio Divina method. Like you can slow down and savor uh, lines from the Psalms and it still fulfills the obligation to pray the office. Um, you know, or you can just pray the Psalms outside and you can pray the Psalter at other times too. But to learn to savor the text to give time with it in silence, to, to go deeper in the text is a way to kind of turn to interior things and to have your heart uh, be softened uh, to the Lord. Okay. You know, I also think it's important too. It can be helpful. Um, like if I just dive into the rosary right away, sometimes it can be a little, um, I'm just pushing through or something. But I find it helps if I just take 30 seconds or like a minute and think about our Blessed Mother, think about what I'm about to do, think about the Lord, think about his majesty, his goodness, right? So just, you know, take 30 seconds, a minute of silence before you enter into your vocal prayer, um, thinking about the Lord, about what you're about to do. Uh, I just find that helps to, to keep me mindful of the Lord as I'm praying, to keep my heart alive to him and my love uh, for our lady as I'm praying the rosary, rather than just kind of mindlessly, shoo, just start kind of diving in right away. Um, so that's, a, you know, can, can help. And since, you know, then he, he develops this, well, what we should really be about the interior, the fountain of living water, right? To use Jeremiah's phrase, and then um, John Tyler pulls in uh, John 7. Jesus says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then he quotes John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. You know, if you asked him, he would give you, you know, the living waters. Um, and so then he, he looks to our thirst Right? They never turn to the interior life for that they have no, no thirst. And so how do we how do we, be, we how do we turn more to interior things? Well, by thirsting for them. How do we turn more to this fountain of living water? Well, by thirsting for the Lord. By directing our thirst to him, we could say, seeing how he's he's the one ultimately we're, we're yearning for, pining for. Um so then at the end of the sermon, in this spirit, I think, of thirsting being the way to drinking more deeply of that fountain of living water, right? How do we drink deeply of the mysteries of God? Well, by thirsting deeply for the mysteries of God. How do we enter most deeply into the saving mysteries of the liturgy? How do we drink deeply of the mysteries of the liturgy? Well, by thirsting deeply uh, for the mysteries as we pray the liturgy. Right, we drink deeply by thirsting deeply, and so then he highlights thirst here uh, to bring us to that interiority, to make God and our desire for God the heartbeat of all our practices. So then, at the end of the sermon, he looks he looks at what Richard of Saint Victor says. He just opens up just a little bit, four degrees of love, but in fact, John Tyler just sticks with the first one, wounded love. So he mentions all four, but his emphasis is on the wounded love, the wound of love, we will say, we would say. And why is that? Well, because I think that, you know, really gets at the thirsting 
to have your heart wounded uh, by the Lord. Uh, and you, you thirst for him, you pine for him. I mean, this, this is John of the Cross's way of describing the wound of love. But I think it's it's just makes sense and it's holds true. It just helps us to understand the wound of love, whoever's speaking about it. But John uh, of the Cross in Spiritual Canticle 7 says there are the wound of love, it, it's caused from a knowledge of God or a glimpse of God and you pine for more. Right? So John of the Cross says there are three levels of the wounds of love. Uh, a wound of love caused by created things. All right, so a good example here is the sunset, the beautiful sunset that leaves that ache in your heart. And what is that ache in your heart? Well, it's a wound of love. You're pining for the creator of the sun. <laughs> You're pining for an ultimate beauty that just this beautiful sunset gives you a glimpse of and you pine for more, right? So that's a wound of love caused by created things. Second level of the wound of love is those caused by articles of faith, by the mysteries of faith. You read a, a, a scripture passage about Jesus and, and you get a sense of his love for you and your love is stirred up and you pine for more of him. So that's a wound of love. Uh, and then the third level of wound of love, John the cross says, comes from touches, Graces of interior prayer, graces of contemplative prayer. You, you catch a glimpse of the Lord and his majesty, just a, a sense of his holiness, his presence, how lovable he is. And you, you pine for more. And in that wound of love, John the cross, he uses a, a great phrase, um, the I don't know what beyond my stammering. Right, Our hearts are awake and yearning for that I don't know what beyond our stammering. That little glimpse we've caught of God and we pine for more of him. That's the wound of love. Uh, pining for the God and his full mystery. That I don't know what beyond our stammering. Okay, so I think that's helpful to appreciate what we mean by wound of love. Yeah, I mean, just think on the natural level of like lover and beloved. Right? You delight to be with the other. And then like the other... Um, you know, goes away or something, right? And then the heart pines, pines for, for the beloved. Uh, that's the wound of love. You, you catch a glimpse of just how great the beloved is. Uh, and then there's a pining for more. Um, so the kind of the natural um, analog of it. And then as applied to God, right? I mean, that's just <laughs> never ending uh, in this life, always pining for more of the Lord. Okay. So we'll read John Toller here. And again, this is on the theme of thirst and um, yeah, how do we get drawn more into interior things and to make everything we do, all our external practices be animated with love of God? Well, by thirsting for God, desiring him and all that we do. Uh, Richard of St. Victor, a great master of spiritual doctrine, speaks of this living water as being four degrees of love. The first degree is wounded love. God wounds the soul with a, a, a stroke. Or with the strike, or uh, with the okay, God wounds the soul with the stroke of true love, and it is thus He grants it the living waters of grace. He says, To illustrate wounded love, I ask you to consider a merchant sailing about in a ship, his heart all wounded with desire of profit. Here and there, everywhere, he gathers his cargo till his ship is filled. Thus acts the soul, it gathers into itself all imaginations of its beloved and is filled with thoughts of him is absorbed in devout practices in honor of the beloved one and thus laid in the ship of the soul starts homeward a strong ship and able to withstand the storm the wind that wafts the ship is love driving it home into the godhead right this strong desire for god is, is like a strong current is the wind in our sails driving us home into the Godhead all properously and according to its longing desires. The rudder is deep down in the ocean that is God. So we just keep on gathering more and more of our desires, of our practices, like cargo on a ship and all this great ship is ordered towards God. Um, but the wound in the soul is ever aching. The more God is granted to the soul, the more the soul longs for him. What seems perfect love 
Turns out, not so. It creates new powers of loving and receiving and enjoying God. New emptiness to be filled. New wounds of love are ever opening. All right, so just this highlight on thirst, on desire, right? And that keeps us turned towards interior things and keeps us turned towards God in the midst of all that we do in our external practices and prayers. Okay. You know, and in this sermon, he, you know, okay, so the, the four degrees of love, a wounded love, a captive love, you know, he doesn't say, he says maybe a line or two about these. Um, so the, just, he just says a line about the second degree captive love. The second degree is captive love. As it is described by the prophet, I will draw them by the cords of Adam. I'll draw them by cords of love, human cords by cords of love. Um, so a captive love, everything else takes second place or everything else is forgotten and God holds your heart and just draws it a fainting love. Um, the third is a fainting love described by the words of the bride in the canticles. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell him that I languish with love. And then he moves on to the fourth degree <laughs> is a devouring love. My soul hath fainted after thy salvation. And in thy word, I have very much hoped. And then he goes back to the wound of love. So um, so he just says, just very brief things about the other degrees of love. And not to see them as like hermetically sealed divisions or something. You know, it's kind of a, a gradual scale here. And, um, you know, yeah, wounded love. And you build, uh, everything is in order towards the beloved. And then it. There, it's more of a swooning love or you're giving everything and uh, pour a love poured out. And then finally, you know, that final Holocaust uh, being fully consumed, a devouring love. Okay. All right. So that's. That's the first sermon. Okay. The Lord rebuking our unbelief. In our hardness of heart. Um, the second sermon, the soul's five captivities, and I'm not going to go, I don't have slides for these, but I'll just mention the five captivities. And again, this is very much uh, fine tuning. Um, and at the end of the sermon, he says, you know, just like Jesus was with the disciples for 40 days to help their love grow, to help them to be turned more towards heavenly things and to be turned towards the Lord and kind of his new mode of existence after his earthly life. Um, and after 10 days of preparing for Pentecost, uh, then now like they're, they're ready for love in a way. So he says for us, okay, it's like 40 days of ascension. Well, it's going to be like 40 years for us. And then 10 days leading up to Pentecost. So it's going to be like 50 years. So, you know, for our love to become mature, uh, it, it's like a 50 year process. <laughs> John Pollard tells us, and it has to happen in God's time. You know, I mentioned before that John Pollard, we get a lot on the dark night. And here's kind of an example here, right? He says, this is page 302, that, you know, 302, 303, that we only grow into this perfect love. We only become heavenly men, right? We only become like fully, um, living the life of grace, heavenly men, a mature love. Like it takes the long haul normally, right? You know, 40, 50 years, and it's in God's time. So these five things that hold us captive, we can't just like by a strong act of the will overcome them. We need to put forth effort for sure. Uh, but there are just some things that we can't get at by effort alone. And so it has to be the passive purifications. It has to be a, a purification that God is the primary mover in and that we surrender to, right? You know, what John the Cross will call the passive nights. Um, so this is all like groundwork for that. This is all in that same spirit. Um, you know, like, okay, so the, the first captivity, the first enslavement is to creatures. So like a disorderly love for creaturely things. Um he says, whether living or dead. <laughs> so whether, you know, physical possessions, material possessions, or, you know, persons that you have a disordered love for or a disordered like fear of or something. Um, so enslavement to 
creatures is the first kind of captivity. The second is uh, slavery of self-love. And he notes that, you know, even like our spiritual pursuits can be motivated by self-love. We can be seeking self um, even in our spiritual pursuits. And right, it, it just, it takes time. It takes a passive purification. It takes a lot of effort on our part as well for us to truly seek God alone with a pure heart. We have a lot of, you know, varying motivations, a lot of ulterior motives. And, you know, they don't like spoil our acts completely. Um, you know, gold that's, you know, not pure gold. It's still gold. It can still be a good act. Uh, but you're not as perfect or beautiful in God's sight as it could be. Um, and so to love God alone, to have that purity of heart where God, his glory, salvation of souls is our primary driving motivation, right? You know, it takes, just takes time, right? To be purified of, of lesser motives. It takes like 40 to 50 years, <laughs> you know, or normally or a can, or, uh, that's the way to kind of think about it. And it, it is, you know, we put forth efforts, we do our best for the Lord. And then we say, okay, yeah, there was some selfishness here. Okay, I surrender to the Lord. And you know, a lot of times things not going our own way. Um, that's the Lord purifying us. And just, you know, God has his ways with us, divine providence. He knows what we need. And so to surrender to him. Right, you know, so you okay, the second slavery is slavery of self-love. And that can even be there in spiritual pursuits. Third captivity is that of intelligence. Now, again, you know, this is John Tyler fine tuning, not coarse tuning. He's, you know, he, he sees the importance of, of intelligence. He's a Dominican. He's very learned himself. Um, but, you know, we can make it so we never let the Lord take us beyond what we can understand. We don't let the Lord take us beyond what we can control, what we have a firm grasp on intellectually. Right. And Toller notes that, you know, human natural light compared to God's infused light, like the human natural light is like a candle brought into the sunlight. Right. And God's light is like the sunlight as it shines. And so to live a radical faith, oftentimes we have to go beyond our natural understanding. And that can just be hard for us. So that's a, a captivity that can hold us back as well. Fourth captivity is sweetness of devotion. Um, and then he says, you know, here's a test. Are you focused on God alone or are, are, you, are you seeking consolations from God? Are you too much dependent upon consolations from God? And he said, Here, here's a test. When the sweet feeling of devotion passes away, do you feel unhappy? unrestful and distressed do you find yourself less faithful and less willing in god's work if so then it is plain that god was not the cause of this this um sensible or this sweetness or you know or just you know maybe better put that um you're still kind of seeking the sweetness of devotion too much you and john toller notes that too or john of the cross that there is an arid love as well. It might not have as much sensible devotion, not the sweetness, but the will is ready to work. John Tyler says, you know, there, there's an energy, a desire to do God's work, even in the midst of aridity and dryness, even when you don't feel the sweetness, there, there's still an energy to work and a solicitude in doing God's service and his work. And that's a sign that God is at work on a deeper level. Right, and that your aridity is not because of something wrong you've done. It's not because you're not applying yourself enough to the spiritual life. Um, but the Lord is about a deeper purification, and the fact that your will is enlivened to to serve God in difficulty shows that you are actually growing in love. You know, he makes a similar comment a little later that Catherine of Siena will make. You know, it's our virtue. That shows whether we're growing in love or not. And so, you know, as we, and then as, you know, it's our virtue is often tried uh, through difficulties. You know, that's when a virtue is kind of proven. Um, I mean, you know, virtue can also be delightful to carry out. And it's, you know, 
no less meritorious because of that. Um, but uh, often it is, you know, through difficulties and trials that we, we do grow, you know, like the virtue of courage or perseverance or patience. Uh, the fifth captivity is a self-will, the need to have our own way, you know, even in the spiritual life, right? You know, so by definition, like that captivity, you can't overcome just by a strong act of the will. You can't overcome your self-will by willing it harder, <laughs> right? Um, it takes a, a passive purification. It takes a surrender to God and his ways. God has to be more primarily in the driver's seat. Um, as you respond, as you surrender, as you say, thy will, not my will be done. Um, So, you know, this is the work that God wants to bring about in our souls. So the five captivities he wants to bring us deeper freedom from through his grace, through our efforts, through surrendering to him and his ways, uh, through all just kind of the details of divine providence. So the first enslavement is to creatures, disorderly love for creatures. Uh, second, cap captivity is slavery to self-love. Third, slavery to intelligence. Fourth, uh, captivity to sweetness of devotion. And then uh, fifth, captivity of self-will. And again, it's going to be a process, you know, maybe for even 40 to 50 years. Okay. So that, that's that sermon. And, you know, again, seeing, seeing the need for like the dark night and trials that God sends. So we're going to return to this for the last sermon that we'll look at. Um, we have a little short one here, though. For the third one, um, how to ascend with Christ into heaven. So this is his third uh, sermon for the Feast of uh, the Ascension. Let me, I'll just go to my slideshow again. Okay. And this is like very Augustinian. You know, you, you'll hear, you'll read similar lines like this in St. Augustine as well in his uh, sermons on the ascension. Where the head is gone, the body follows. Where Christ goes, our hearts follow. Our hearts follow him up to heaven. All right? And, and that's <laughs> that's one of the reasons for the, the wounds of love. This is Francis de Sales. So I told you, okay, so John of the Cross Spiritual Canticle 7, he defines the wounds of love uh, as, you know, like a, a greater knowledge of God that, that leads to a longing for more. And there's a little like prick <laughs> uh, in, in love in that way. A little man of glimpse of God and, and you pine for more that I don't know what beyond my stammering. You know? The sunset can bring that. Uh, you're reading the scriptures can bring that. Uh, God's work in your soul, touches of love and prayer can bring that. Okay. Francis de Sales in his treatise on divine love, uh, let's see if I can remember it, but he says there are three reasons for the wound of love. Um, <laughs> one, he says, is, is just the nature of desire. Desire has like a little prick to it, a little like yearning, an ache. It just belongs to the dynamic of the desire of love. Um. The third, uh, the third, okay, the, the one I, I was, why I thought of this, the one I want to focus on is this one, is that Francis de Sales says, you know, our heart can be whole. And in a way, you know, like it's whole and integrated, right? But then you fall in love and then you like give your heart away. And now your heart is like split. <laughs> uh, the beloved has it. And now like, uh, the other half is in your your chest <laughs> and the other half is, 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 is in the beloved. And so to think of, about that with Christ ascending into heaven, our hearts go with him. And so now, okay, we may have had like an in integrated whole heart before, but now your heart is split because you've given half of it to your beloved, the Lord. He ascends into heaven. And so you're, we're in like this painful place. Um. Angela Foligno will describe this as like a man hanging between heaven and earth, right? If you know, we grow, we, we forsake the things of earth, pining for things of heaven. We forsake the things of earth for the sake of, of the Lord and things of 
heaven yet. We don't fully possess the things of heaven. So we're like a man suspended between heaven and earth hanging there. <laughs> uh, no earthly consolations because you've forsaken it and you moved on, yet you're not fully experiencing heavenly consolation. So you're kind of, uh, uh, so that's another right reason for the wound of love is because your heart belongs to Christ and he's ascended to the father, hidden with Christ and God. Uh, not yet manifest. So that's a kind of painful place for uh, for love, um, for the heart. Oh, yeah. And I can't remember the third from Francis de Sales. But uh, but yeah, anyway, so that's, that's the one most related to our theme here. Okay. Okay, so uh, John Tyler. Third Sermon for the Ascension. Indeed, they have they they had loved him well. And we know that where one's treasure is, there is his heart also. Right? The Lord Jesus himself says that. Matthew 6. Where your treasure is, there is your heart also. All right, so if we have our treasure in heaven, our, our heart's going to be in heaven. And right, that's, that's kind of a <laughs> painful place sometimes uh, to have your heart split that way. Indeed, they had loved him well, and we know that where one's treasure is, there is his heart also. Jesus, car Jesus Christ carries away with him in his glorious ascension the hearts and senses and all the faculties of his chosen friends. Never again can they fill at home in this world. Right, that's just scriptural language. We're aliens and strangers in this world, First Peter. Uh, and then we have those Hebrews passages um, uh, yearning for our heavenly homeland, and so forth. Never again can they feel at home in this world. All their goings and comings and all their life is now in heaven. All is now with God. Right? You know, it's hard to like sink ourselves, to root ourselves in God. And so like this radical turning to things above that Colossians 3 suggests that John Tyler is suggesting, uh, help us to root ourselves in God, right? Because we do tend to be rooted in things we can see, things in the sensory world. That's where what we tend to lean upon, uh, a, a bank account, you know, that's security for us. And it's in the sensory world of, you know, commerce and being able to buy things and um, and you know, all that there's a place for it, right? But when it becomes um something we lean on too much or something that gets in the way of our leaning on completely on the Lord, well then the Lord sometimes wanna kind of shake that up so we do lean on him. And so turning to heavenly things and remembering how quickly the things of this earth pass then help us to root ourselves to lean on God more completely. And, you know, by the way, like this is also the message of Isaiah, the prophet. Um, you know, the Lord alone is your savior. Uh, and we always try to find salvation in something else, something that we can more easily control and be in charge of. And Isaiah, uh, the nations, uh, the Lord's always laying low the nations, laying low our pride, our pride too. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground uh, so that we'll lean on him alone. Right, And that's part of the purifications in this life. The trials are so that we lean on God alone and trust in him as savior and not our human solutions. And so fixing our hearts on things above can help us to, to make that radical leap, uh, that radical orientation of leaning on the Lord. Um, all their goings and comings and all their life is now in heaven. All is now with God. Dear children. Children, how can it be otherwise? Must not the members be with the head? And our head has this day most affectionately gone before us to prepare a place for us. In my father's house, there are many rooms, right? And he goes and prepares a place for us. He's going to come again and take us to himself so that where he is, we may be also. John 14, one through three. In the ascension, he's, he's going to the father's house, preparing that place, right? And the way Jesus and his body, his mystical body is, the father's house. He is the temple of God, the dwelling of God with man. Hence, we can but echo the words of the bride in the canticle. 
the Colts. Draw me after thee. Who can prevent us following our head? Jesus Christ, right? And faith and hope. We follow our head into heaven. Who can prevent us following our head? Jesus Christ. He himself said, I ascend to my father and your father. His principle of life, his final end, his eternal bliss are all made one with ours and him. So, you know, the theological virtue of hope, there's a nice uh, word um, to live proleptically. And to live proleptically uh, means to begin to live already now in that final state of affairs in heaven, that day when God will be all in all. To live that proleptically, it's to stretch forward and beginning to live that now in our mind and heart. Right, And that's the way we bring God's peace into this world. That's the way we do bring light from above into this world. That's the way we do bring uh, God's life, his mystery, that uno se que, that I don't know what, beyond my stammering. How do we like give other people contact with that? How do we bear that forth? Well, we have to be heavenly men and women, our minds and hearts following Christ up into heaven, dwelling there more than on earth. And that's how we transform this earth, not according to some like human program, social program, well, that can be part of it, uh, but according to God and his designs and the kingdom of God that, that comes from him, the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from heaven, beautiful as a bride prepared to meet her husband. Um, and the Lord draws us. Think of uh, John 12, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. And he continues to draw us as a magnet, right? Love draws us, desire draws us. As the magnet draws iron to itself, though so does Jesus Christ draw after himself all hearts that he touches. And furthermore, as the iron itself receives the magnet's power of attraction and is moved and lifted up and joined to the magnet in spite of its own nature, so it is with souls touched by the magnet of the eternal Son of God. Such men no longer feel the force of their own love or own joy or consolation. They are drawn out of themselves, upward to God. They forget the laws of their own nature and follow the touch of God, living a radical supernatural life. And this they do all the more readily and perfectly, according as they are more deeply influenced by the divine attraction. Right? Eucharistic adoration, we let that magnet draw us. We let the Lord draw us, reading the scriptures, the living word of God. We let uh, that magnet have its influence on us as we're captivated, drawn up beyond our natural bounds. Francis de Sales uh, speaks of the ecstasy of contemplation. And he means by ecstasy there is something a little different than like Teresa of Avila. He don't, doesn't mean like a technical term uh, of you know being wrapped out of your senses or something. It's more of a habitual state of standing outside of yourself, more focused on God than yourself. A habitual state of being focused on God more than self. The ecstasy of contemplation. And then uh, Francis de Sales says there's also an ecstasy of life. And by that, he means living a radically supernatural life, living beyond your natural bounds, living beyond earthly things, even as you're like gaping <laughs> out into like the seeming absence and hope, um, reaching out proleptically uh, into that, that next state of affairs, dwelling with God, bringing his peace, his love into our world. Um and so this ecstasy of life drawn out of ourselves, standing outside of ourselves, right? And this ecstasy of life also involves an ecstasy of service, putting the other before yourself as you serve your neighbor, as you serve your, your family members, and as you serve uh, the church, this radical orientation towards the other, right? And the, the two um, build each other, ecstasy of contemplation and ecstasy of, of service, ecstasy of life. And uh, how do we like grow like in this interior life? Yeah, I think that this line from John Tyler here, follow the touch of God. Follow the touch of God. That's, a, that's a, just a good principle for interior prayer. How do you find that, that deeper place of contact with the Lord? 
how do you find like, like how do you um, find that deeper place in your soul where God abides? How do you let him draw you into deeper interiority? Well, by following the touch of God, following the, the attraction, following uh, what St. Augustine calls the silent music that you catch in the depths of your soul, the indwelling Trinity. Uh, follow the touch of God into that deeper place of prayer and interiority. And that this isn't going to be easy. It's going to involve a lot of hard work. You know, somewhere else he says, you know, yeah, it's a great joy to be on top of the mountain with Jesus. Total bliss, complete joy. Yeah, but it's, it's hard work climbing up to the top. Right, And so he says here, children, be sure that whosoever does not struggle up this mount will always remain spiritually sterile and will amount to nothing. Right, We need to reach beyond ourselves to live a supernatural life, to live a life for others, to live a life for God. Otherwise, we'll be spiritually sterile. Right? We have to go beyond ourselves. A devout man should keep his longing eyes fixed on uh, his uh, something spouse, sweet spouse, uh, uh, our spouse, um, Jesus Christ ascended now so far above him and so hidden and unknown, hidden with Christ and God. Realize fully that the deeper the touch of God in your soul, the more surely is one side of your life a valley of tears. <laughs> All right, the more the Lord touches you, the more he draws you into heavenly things. And the, yeah, the more just sometimes, right, you're like that man suspended between heaven and earth. Um, you know, Angela Foligno, she was a little earlier than John Powler, Teresa of Avila, actually. Um, there are some traces of Angela Foligno and Teresa of Avila. And so Teresa uses that same image of the man hanging between heaven and earth. Um, okay, so yeah, it's gonna take hard work climbing the mountain. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, the third sermon. Um, and there's an emphasis here on the end as well to surrender to God's will. To, to totally die to self. Ascend therefore high up into God's will. Sincerely deny thyself in all things, both the spirit and flesh. I say to you that in your inmost soul, you must, you must die to everything, right? If the eternal God shall become your only life. This devout spirit must ever and again be renewed by the fire of divine love, and it must be aided by earnest searching in the soul's depths, lest something that is not God in all truth shall be hiding there. And again, this is a fine-tuning knob. Um, and, you know, a general process here, gradual process. Okay. So now let's let's get into the, the last uh, sermon. For this group of sermons we were looking at uh, this evening. And for the verse that begins this sermon, it's from the Acts of the Apostles and before Christ ascends into heaven, he says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. So the title is how we witness to Christ and unrest and, and suffering, right? And we, you know, if we can just witness to the Lord, live a good Christian life, just when it feels good, just when we're experiencing sweetness, right? We're never going to be true, radical witnesses to God in his life. And so this sermon, we're going to enter into more like material about the dark night, and how, yeah, we need consolations to kind of refresh us, to stir up our, our love, uh, to focus us on heavenly things, to draw us to things above, to give us wings, to help our wings grow. We need like a taste of God, a savor of him for energy in the ascent, uh, right? But then for our love to mature, to grow more deeply, it's going to be uh, purified through trials often, times we need to surrender, persevere in our daily duties, Right, that, that's a purification of love as well. Steadiness in your daily duties and your vocation. 
right? God tells Catherine of Siena, she, he loves three things in the soul, patience, courage, perseverance, right? And uh, those three things, they really kind of come <laughs> uh, through um, the daily grind, daily faithfulness. You grow in perseverance, right? It, just by definition, it takes a long time to grow in perseverance and patience. And there are things, right? You know, God, he, he's going to take sometimes 40 to 50 years with us. He has a whole lifetime with us. So sometimes, you know, you know a lot depends on our generosity towards responding to him. Um, but no, he's in it for the long haul, the Lord. And so it's often, yeah, daily perseverance that our, our love is being purified. Acts of the will, choosing to serve God and, and our neighbor. You know, and then we grow in perseverance, patience, courage. Um, and they're kind of the, the crown of charity. They bring love to, to its perfection. And so John of the Cross here is going to, John Toller here is going to talk about how peace, for it to be really the peace of God, um, it has to like endure even an unrest or put differently, you know, as we grow, we need to learn to find God's peace in the midst of unrest, right? If I can just find peace when I'm kind of just sprawled out in the chapel during my holy hour, um, I mean, you know, when we first start out, okay, maybe that's the only place we can find peace, or maybe that's where we find the deepest peace. Um, but, you know, over time, we want that that peace to, to spread out through all our activities. And so, yeah, it's going to be at times when um, unexpected things happen, when the, the rug is pulled out from, from under you, when you had plans and they get disrupted and you have to surrender, right? These trials, these times of unrest, of finding uh, that still point of God and faith and hope um, is how we're going to enter into true peace, right? Jesus says um, he gives us a peace that the world cannot understand, a peace that transcends all, all understanding and a peace that the world cannot understand. Well, surely the world can understand a peace that comes from when everything like falls into proper place, when we're not stretched, when everything goes as planned. Okay, the world can understand that peace. Right, the peace that the world can't understand is a peace that you know comes, let's say, in the midst of turmoil, trial, persecution, uh, chaos. <laughs> right, you know, someone who can remain um, peaceful in the midst of chaos and can be that stabilizing influence on others. Um, you know, what a witness to God and God's peace, and that. And so that's what John Toller is going to lead us to uh, in, in, in this sermon. Oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah, to, to really find God's peace has to come in unrest. Okay, so. John Tyler says, all men seek peace in their relations of life, but my dear children, we must die to this kind of seeking after peace and go forth out of it. We must seek for peace in another way, namely in the midst of unrest. I mean, you know, it's fine, obviously, to be at peace in these other <laughs> situations as well, but, you know, a little rhetorical uh, flourish here. Uh, we must seek for peace in another way, namely in the midst of unrest and that with all earnestness. That peace alone can give us a supernatural, holy, and divine life. That peace alone generates in us true and divine peace, always abiding, ever enduring within us. All right, so let's just pause there for a moment. You know, how do we find this peace? Um, or what is it like? You know, like a generation or two later, the French School of Spirituality kind of gives a good articulation to it. Francis de Sales. I mean, it's already in the tradition and we can find things like this in John Tyler, but just, you know, just speak about the upper part of the soul, the lower part of the soul. Um, John, the, John Francis de Sales, rather, speaks of the theological virtues, 
their proper home is in the higher part of the soul, intellect, will, pure active intellect, pure active will, right? The lower part of the soul are where the emotions are, affectivity. The soul as relates to the sensible world, the world we can see, that's kind of the lower part of the soul, the emotions, the affectivity. And the higher part of the soul is more pure spirit, pure acts of faith, pure acts of hope, pure acts of charity, right? And then we have the indwelling trinity, which we access through faith, through hope, through charity. And so this means, right, whatever our emotional subjective state, we can still make an act of faith in God's presence and his love. We can still make an act of hope in God's omnipotent help in our life. We can still make an act of trust. It might not be consoling. It might seem like forced or just like a, in it, but it still really is an act of faith, really is an act of hope. It really is an act of trust and love. And the more that we can live in that part of the soul, Think about how you want the apex of the soul or the ground of the soul or El Centro del Ama, the center of the soul. It's the Carmelite's way of speaking about it. And to over time develop that art, that graced art of finding that still point of faith, hope in the depths of your soul, the indwelling trinity in the midst of trial, chaos. You know, emotionally, you can be all worked up, perturbed. Uh, but you can still find that strong foundation in the Lord through faith, hope, and charity. Teresa of Avila uses the image of it. You know, it's like a king who's in his castle and his nation, his kingdom is at war and the boundaries of the kingdom are at war, like with a neighbor, neighboring country. Um, but the king in the midst of like, like this battle, the, the king is secure in his castle in the center of the nation. And so we too, the boundaries of our being can be at like war. We can be agitated. We can be worried. Uh, we can be caught up in things. Um, and yet we can still, in the depths of the soul, indwell in Trinity, find that place of security. Another image that's used, um, Jean-Pierre de Cassade, you know, talks about climbing the mountain, the apex, the high part of the soul, like above the storm clouds. And you're still in the midst of the storm, but kind of in the highest part of your soul, the loftiest part of yourself, you're able, you, you can ascend above the storm cloud and you can kind of look down on things and see them more from God's perspective, from a place of calm and peace, through faith, through hope, through charity. Gregor Nazianza says, Oh, living word of God, the still point of our soul, right? So we want to be that wise man who builds our house on the rock, the word of God, doing what we, we believe, building your, your life on the word of God. And that's our still point. Oh, living word of God, the still point of the soul, our resting place, our still point. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity speaks about the invincible fortress of recollection. There's a strength when we recollect ourselves and seek the indwelling Trinity above, beyond, deeper than whatever else is going on. And yeah, it's an invincible fortress of recollection. So John Pollard would, would have us to find peace there. And if you can come to find peace there, even in the midst of, of trial and turmoil, uh, it's a good sign that it's, it's the Lord's peace and it's based on him. And not just on you or some uh, lesser, lesser thing than God himself. You know, a peace that doesn't depend on circumstances. A peace that can endure whatever happens. Okay. All men seek peace in their relations of life. But my dear children, we must die to this kind of seeking after peace or you must go beyond it, go forth out of it, something more. We must seek for peace in another way, namely in the midst of unrest and that with all earnestness. That peace alone can give us a supernatural, holy and divine life. 
That peace alone generates in us true and divine peace, always abiding, ever enduring within us. Any other peace causes us to use self-deception, right? Because it's, it's, it's unstable. It's wavering. It's not built on God himself. It's, it's built on you being in a good mood <laughs> or everything going right or well. Um, and so it can deceive us. And then we can feel strong, stronger than we really are because we're confident in self more than God. But if you can, if but if thou canst be willing to seek joy and sorrow, steadfast peace and unrest, single mindedness, of single mindedness amid multiplicity, right? To seek comfort in the midst of bitterness, then veritably thou shalt be made a worthy witness of God. Yeah, I mean, think about the martyrs, right? They're able to remain joyful and at peace. You know, at least some of them, right? Uh, even to the point of death. You know, turn me over, St. Lawrence says, as he's being uh, grilled. Um, and, you know, that is the mark of Christian joy, to be joyful even in the midst of persecution. Um, all right, First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 onwards, bears witness to this consolation in the midst of affliction. And that word consolation there is paraclesis. And so the Holy Spirit is hidden within that. You know, 1 Corinthians has those chapters about the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of still on St. Paul's mind, the second epistle to the Corinthians. And so that word paraclesis in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 shows up 10 times, which is surely not a mistake. Uh, 10 times that paraclesis and that uh, comfort in the midst of affliction we comfort you with the same comfort we have received in the mid, you know, in the midst of, of turmoil and affliction and ten times paraclesis, right? And the Holy Spirit's hidden there. The fullness of paraclesis is the paraclete. But if you can be will, if you can be willing to seek joy and sorrow, steadfast peace and unrest, single-mindedness amid multiplicity, comfort and bitterness then veritably thou shalt be made a worthy witness of God, right? It'll be steadfast. Jesus Christ promises chosen followers peace, both before his death and after his resurrection. Yet as long as they lived, they never found outward peace. But they nonetheless really found peace amid all their troubles, and they got it from all the unpeaceful men they met. Essential peace, right? They had to go, they had to go through the trial. They stood immovably peaceful in all pain and pleasure. He says, then uh, there are many men whose souls and bodies are so saturated with divine sweetness that it seems to flow through their very veins and marrow. But when suffering comes and when they are left in darkness, when they seem forsaken by God and creatures, both interiorly and externally, then they are at a loss to know what to do with themselves. Nothing good can be made of them. Dear children, when the tempest strikes men's souls, that is to say, when interior abandonment oppresses them, and when opposition and temptations assail them from without, when the world, the flesh, and the devil conspire against them, whichever one of them can stand up against all this with genuine patience, will, and true peace, he will find essential peace in all trouble, a peace that no creature can take from him. And whosoever does not tread this path shall never attain to true peace. Okay. Right, so it's not about fleeing the storm, right? It's it's about finding the eye of the storm. I mean, you know, sometimes we're we are allowed to flee the storm and seek refuge in the Lord in that peaceful abode of the Adoration Chapel, um, right? But there are times too, and at some point, we need to face the storm and find the eye of the storm. And it's, you know, through passing through afflictions and surrender to the Lord, trustful surrender. This is key to this whole picture too. Trusting that God is good, surrendering to his will, how it shows itself through divine providence in your life, right? And then we actually build our lives on the Lord. John Tyler continues, while we enjoy these feelings, we flatter ourselves that we are right with God. And we imagine that we cannot yearn enough after him, nor even be satisfied with him. But when the shock of spiritual adversity strikes us, then we do not know what to think of our former state or how we now stand with God. 
And this shows that formerly the interior foundation was not God alone. All right, the interior foundation could have been built on consolations, could have been built on self-sufficiency, could have been built on earthly things, things happen, you know, this uh, things being as you want them. All this shows that formerly the interior foundation was not God alone. And how can our interior foundation be God alone? Well, it takes being stripped of these other things and living more radically by faith, more radically by hope, more radically by charity. Sweet feelings of devotion were the unstable basis on which our confidence in God was built. Not just God alone, God in all joy and all sorrow. God's true witnesses ever rest fast and firm on God alone and on his most adorable will. Right, Surrender to God's will, trust in him. Come will, come woe. God gives or God takes away. They remain always in peace, resting wholly in God, not at all on their own devotional contrivances. And so it happens frequently that such men can accomplish nothing. If they would gladly keep holy vigil, they fall asleep in spite of themselves. <laughs> right? right? You know, God has to wean us from our consolations. He has to wean us from our dependence upon consolations. And so that sometimes means that our emotional fervor is taken away. Right? And then we're, we're forced to find that deeper place of drive, of the will of our love gone underground, of that flame still alive under the ashes. Uh, we're falling asleep, <laughs> right? Even as like Therese falls asleep during her times of prayer, yet we keep pressing on. So it happens frequently that such men cannot can accomplish nothing, right? Because they have to be brought to a place of complete dependence on God, a place of complete trust in God. If before they might have been able to like trust in their, their righteous practices, their fasting, their good works, how many vigils they kept, how many rosaries they cranked out. And now all of, a, all of a sudden, all that's taken from them, from the Lord, or all devotion and fervor is taken from them in those things, right? And so they can't trust in them anymore. They can't trust in a human measure anymore, right? If I crank out five uh, complete rosaries, uh, in my time before the Blessed Sacrament, I can walk away feeling I've accomplished something, right? Uh, and when the Lord takes that away or takes that fervor away, what do you have to trust in? Only the Lord, only his goodness, only his precious blood poured out for you. And to do our best, do what we can in, in love, but to trust in the Lord. And so, yeah, it's this lack of felt fervor uh, that often helps bring this about. They try to fast and cannot but help but eat. They crave repose and they are forced into the very opposite. All this happens because God would withdraw from them all support but himself alone. On him simply and solely must they rest. Themselves being annihilated in all things of soul and body. Right, That self-surrender, that self-giving of yourself to the Lord completely. Their souls dropping down deep into pure single-hearted faith in God, resting simply on the only true foundation, namely God's own self, held and possessed in true poverty of spirit. The same program of spiritual progress that we find in Isaiah, the Lord tears it down, tears it down to the ground, our pride, our self-sufficiency, so we lean on him alone, the Lord alone as Savior. He alone is our hope, right? And it's often that the trials and difficulties that bring us to that place of poverty of spirit, dependence upon the Lord, no Savior but him. And John Tyler notes that, just a little, you know, the same sermon, that one way to help this whole process uh, is uh, through gratitude, thanking the Lord for his goodness, trusting him, turning to the abyss of God's love and thanking him. Judea also may be taken to mean the praise of God. Ah, children, if a man could be, but be guided to praise the eternal God in all things, no matter whence they come, interior or exterior, for him or against him, then indeed would he be journeying along the right road. And if a man would but offer all things up to God with thanksgiving, 
then he would become a true witness of God. Therefore, dear children, render back into God's deep being all that has thence come forth to thee. Do this invariably and never tarry in your own self, which is mere nothingness. Rather, restore yourself habitually to your source and origin, namely the abyss of God's love. We came from love and we returned to love. We're nothing in ourselves, but we're everything as we turn to the Lord. We're who we're called to be as we're built up upon the Lord. Nothing in ourselves, everything we're called to be as we turn to the Lord. And as we turn to the abyss of God's love, we recognize that God's love exceeds our understanding. That what God is about in our lives and through divine providence and his infinite wisdom far surpasses ours. So returning to the Lord, turning to the abyss of God's love helps us to appreciate that God's love is behind everything that's happening. And it's a, a, a love that's based on a higher wisdom that we have. It's an abyss of God's love, not something we can control, but something we can only surrender to, cast ourselves on the ocean of God's love, of a rich wandering and super essential love to use John Roosbrook's phrase, a rich wandering and super essential love. When we lose our bearings, having no other compass but faith, no other compass but hope, no other compass but charity, faith, open charity, that's our only, only compass. In this abyss of God's love, this oceans of God's love, where we lose our bearings yet entrust ourselves to him. Next paragraph, and absorbed into the divine abyss of being, the soul need do nothing more than humbly abandon itself to enjoy all the gifts of God's grace. For now it beholds them in God. It is entirely without self-consciousness concerning them. There's no longer any self-possessiveness. It's totally focused on God and faith, hope, and charity. Beyond self, right? The aridity, the difficulties uh, have brought you beyond the selfish self and need for consolation, so forth. Okay. After this, again, the soul is led into yet another heaven in the divine being, in which it loses itself and sinks into God. You know, loses itself in the sense of like excessive self-concern or any self-concern, losing yourself in love of God, losing yourself in the beauty of God, uh, sinking deeper into God. No man can tell what happens there to the soul in the possession of God and, and his enjoyment. Can neither tell nor think nor even understand. How can the soul tell or understand what's come upon it? While it was melted out of itself and absorbed in the divine abyss, knowing nothing, seeing nothing, feeling nothing, but only the pure, simple being of God. We might say uh, knowing nothing, seeing nothing, feeling nothing but the pure, simple abyss of God's love, right? which is his being. Let love do thy planning. Beautiful attitude to the events of life, to God's plan of holiness for us. Let love do your planning. Let love be the focus. Be confident that all comes from love, returns to love. Uh, and then let your heart beat uh, with that love of God and all that we do. Our hearts uh, taken captive by the Lord, our hearts ascending uh, to the right hand of the Father where Christ is. Um, and so we pray uh, together as Christ has taught us uh, that our hearts might be fixed on things above in the Father's house and for the Father's glory. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Any questions or, or comments to look at? Okay.
Yes, hold on. I see. So, okay, some questions are coming. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, someone comments, I uh, made this comment. It is as though Jesus, while on the cross, illustrated for For us what it would be like for us to have wounds of love for him as he bore his own wounds of love for us and then um yeah right yeah i mean jesus he too bears that that wound of love okay Um, just because I couldn't remember what Francis de Sales, the third mark of the wound of love. Um, oh gosh, let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, uh, Francis de Sales, pray for us. Uh, where is it? Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so let me... Um, okay, so I'll try to talk and look at the same time. <laughs> okay, a wound of love. Okay. Uh, ooh, yeah. Okay, great. 268. Francis says, love is... Um, Love is the first, yea, the principle and origin of all the passions. And therefore it is love that first enters the heart. And because it penetrates and pierces down to the very bottom of the will where its seat is, we say it wounds the heart. It is sharp and enters into the spirit most deeply. He says, Francis de Sales, verily love is bittersweet. And while we live in this world, it never has a sweetness perfectly sweet because it is not perfect nor ever purely satiated and satisfied. And yet it fails not to be a very agreeable taste. It's tartness correcting the, the luciousness of its sweetness as its sweetness heightens the relish of its tartness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what has wounded him? Love. But love being the child of complacency or delighting in or rejoicing in and the other love being the, the child of that kind of attunement towards the other uh, how can it wound and give pain sometimes the beloved object is absent and then love wounds the heart by the desire which it excites this is this it is which being unable to satiate itself grievously torments the spirit All right, there's a sting of desire. Okay, so now he says, now the painful wounds of love are of many sorts. He says, number one. Yes, okay. Um, okay, yeah, the third, yeah. So the third one I forgot. Okay, so one, so um, number one, it's painful for the heart to be torn from itself to belong to another. Right, half of our hearts with God in heaven, half, and so it's pain. It's a wound of love that division the heart. Francis describes it this way: the first strokes we receive from love are called wounds because the heart, which appeared sound, entire, and all its own before it loved, being struck with love, begins to separate and divide itself from itself to give itself to the beloved object. Now, this separation cannot be made without pain. Seeing that pain is nothing but the division of living things which belong to one another. Um, so yeah, the, the heart's kind of torn in two. Uh, number two, uh, the wound of love, reason for the wound of love is desire stings and wounds. So he just says in a sentence, desire incessantly stings and wounds the heart in which it is as we have said. You know, so a, a heart that loves and that desires, there's going to be a sting to that. Uh, the number three, the reason for the wound of love, 
is we're unable to love God as much as we would want to. Or we just feel that deep in our bones, just God's great love for us and just that that pain that we can't give an adequate return for that on that. Um, for he gives her admirable sentiments and incomparable attractions for his sovereign goodness as if pressing and soliciting her to love him. And then she forcibly lifts herself as up to soar higher towards her divine object, but stopping short because she cannot love as much as she desires. Oh God, she feels a pain which has no equal. At the same time that she is powerfully drawn to fly towards her dear well-beloved, she is also powerfully kept back and cannot fly being chained to the base miseries of this mortal life and of her own powerlessness. She desires the wings of a dove that she may fly away and be at rest, and she finds them not. There, then, she is rudely tormented between the violence of her desires and her own powerlessness. Yeah, so, um, so that's page 270, the Treatise on Divine Love. And yeah, Jesus on the cross shows the wound of love. And right when Christ rises from the dead, God the Father could have gotten rid of those wounds on his side and in his hands, right? But no, he glorifies them. And that's to say something about our own wounded hearts, our own wounds of love. Now that there, there's something that will remain about them in, in eternity, not the pain, not, not the sorrow, but they'll be made something beautiful. John of the Cross says that whatever the source of our wounds, the Holy Spirit can transform them into wounds of love. Right? Whatever our weaknesses or whatever our wounds from the past, they can cause a tenderness in the heart to make us more compassionate towards others suffering. Uh, they can make us cast ourselves on the Lord more. Wounds from the past just kind of pains of spirit, just kind of a, a, an emptiness, a need. Uh, they can cause us to cast ourselves on the Lord more. And so these wounds, yeah, they can be transformed into wounds of love. And then John the Cross notes that the, the healthy lover is the wounded lover. Um, so yeah, as Jesus illustrates the wounds of love on the cross. Okay, the next question is on page 300, uh, Father Tyler says, it were better for a man in this state that he quit praying as he does for he prays for what is against his own best interest. And then the question is, is it that he is praying too much for creatures, for his own spiritual success? Um, okay, so let me, so page 300. Let's see what the passage is here. Yeah, I'm not immediately finding that passage. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just try to figure it out. Okay. It, it were better for a man in this day that he quit praying as he does, for he prays for what is against his own best interest. Um. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's the need for desire. I mean, the need for surrender. The need for surrender. You know, sometimes our prayer can be too self-willed, or it can be that we think we know what's best, and so we just pray for that. Um, and kind of a stubborn way. Um, and, you know, we're, we are caught to pray steadfastly and with perseverance for things, uh, but we also do need surrender. You know, Jesus too prays that the cup may pass, um, but then he does pray, Father, thy will be done. Um, so, I mean, that's, oh, I see it now. I'm sorry. Yep, I see it now. Top of page 300. Okay, so let me, okay, so I'll start at the bottom of 299. Okay, so it's, he's talking about enslavement to creatures, 
Uh, he says, another class of men are in this hurtful captivity of attachment to creatures and abide in it with all security of feeling holy, deaf, and blind to their misery. They live on quite free from anxiety and must have themselves reckoned as pious men. They do many good things, sing and read piously or keep the rule of silence. They serve and pray much. Their purpose, however, by all this is that they may be approved as devout souls by their fellows and may have some feeling of being right with God. How dangerous a state for all the time it is the evil one who guides them, keeping them in captivity. And besides their natural vagaries mislead them and they are assailed by grievous temptations. It were better for a man in this state that he quit praying as he does, for he prays for what is against his own best interest. Far better that he sank into oppression of soul and woe and sorrow. This would much sooner lead him to a release from his deadly captivity, for he is under the power of Satan and is in danger of dying so and being eternally lost. Whoa. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, it's a, I understand the earlier part a, a little better. I mean, yeah, we can all understand someone doing religious practices that they might be approved as devout souls by other people. And this, you know, this next line is kind of interesting too, a little more sophisticated or, yes, sophisticated, nuance or um, interesting. <laughs> uh, or, you know, may have some feeling of being right with God. Right? I mean, that can just motivate people for doing external practices. They're just a a sense of rightness with God and kind of a self-complacency in that. So it's not so much about giving your whole heart to the Lord as you're kind of like just fulfilling this obligation. Now you can get on with the rest of your life. You've done your Sunday mass. You've done what's required of your rule of life. And now you can kind of get on with things uh, for the day. Um, but, you know, that's not seeking to give God your whole heart. Um how dangerous a state for all the time is the evil one who guides them, keeping them in captivity. You know, it's kind of a stark contrast. I mean, there, there can be times too, where the person seeking of God is just not perfect. It's not purely for God. Some of these wayward motivations, ulterior motives can enter in. Um, and so um, it might not be entirely like the devil guiding them, um, but you know, the devil can be influencing them and are there just love can be imperfect, um, in these ways as well. But, um, but you know, someone can fall into deeper sin and where they really are doing external practices just, um, to be honored by others. Well, that's a very dangerous place to be. Um, and besides their natural vagaries mislead them and they are assailed by grievous temptations, it were better for a man in the state that he quit praying as he does, for he prays for what is against his own interest. Far better that he sank into oppression of soul and woe and sorrow. Um, maybe in like contrition, compunction, sinking down. So rather than kind of keeping things going superficially, okay, my religious observance is still the same as it has been. And so I feel right with God. Everyone else thinks I'm doing fine, doing great. Um, so to keep going like that would not be good for the soul. Better that he would um, sink into oppression of soul and woe and sorrow to see himself as he truly is and not just count on this facade of just religious practices, but just see the state of his soul as it is and repent and be filled with contrition and compunction. Um, this would much sooner lead him to a release from his deadly captivity, right? So that's, you know, that's one way to, I think that's, anyways, I'm, <laughs> that's the best I can come up with. Okay. Yeah, so the Francis de Sales, I just read, Treatise on Divine Love. Um, I think I gave the page number. Um, Yeah, so just um, just again, uh, the page number. Um, uh, 
Okay. 268 is where that section starts. Or just another way to put it, it's book six of Treatise on Divine Love, Treatise on the Love of God, Francis de Sales, book six and chapter Now my eyes can't find it again. Sorry. Oh, gosh. Chapter 13. So book six, chapter 13. Okay. All right. Great. Oh, title of the chapter, of course. All right. So book six is called Of the Exercises of Holy Love and Prayer. And then chapter 13 of book six is of the wound of love. Okay. All right. So, okay. I think we're at a good stopping place. All right. So next month, uh, it will be uh, preparing for the Holy Spirit for Pentecost. And it will be pages 322 to 41. And I think, yeah, these sermons on Pentecost are really rich and kind of uh, among some of the best sermons of John Teller. So see you next month, May 15th, to, um, May 15th, Wednesday, uh, 7.30, uh, and uh, pages 322 to 341. See you then. All right. Good night, everyone. God bless you. Happy Easter.